What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living in a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into another very interesting organized crime topic. And when I'm on live or talking about organized crime, I'm always presented with the same question, probably in every live I do, whether it's on TikTok or YouTube. Who is your favorite gangster of all time? Now, for that question, for me, it's a little bit of a weird one. I'm not sure that I have any favorite. All of the people that we discuss on this channel aren't exactly good people. That said, I do find them very interesting. The person I find the most interesting would probably be regarded as my most favorite. Today, we're going to talk about him. A man who at one point, in my opinion, was the most powerful individual in the five families. And over the years, made more money than anyone ever associated with the American Mafia. The story of Anthony Fat Tony Salerno next on the sit-down. Anthony Salerno was born on August 15th, 1911. Now, according to FBI files, there are multiple reasons to believe that he was born on a number of three different days in August, in and around August 15th. We don't have his exact birth date, but many people believe it was August 15th, 1911. Now, Tony Salerno was actually born in the Bronx, New York. However, he would grow up in East Harlem. Now, I've talked about East Harlem a lot. Uh, during the 10s, 20s, 30s, really into the 50s, East Harlem was, to be fair, the most populous Italian community in the United States. At its height, Nearly 100,000 Italian people lived in East Harlem. Now, Fat Tony, his parents were called Alfred and Mary Salerno, and they had a pretty big family. By the early 30s, Fat Tony Salerno would begin running around under the crew of Trigger Mike Coppola. Now, by the early 30s, Trigger Mike would take over from his mentor, Sierra the Artichoke King, Terranova. For anyone that's not aware, the modern mafia in America in the late 1800s into the early 1900s, the base of operations for those groups, i.e. the Morello crime family, was in Harlem. And if you know anything about the 116th Street crew, that's essentially where a lot of the early mafia began in this country in New York. So East Harlem has always been a burgeoning mob area. Now, Mike Coppola would take over the rackets and numbers from Sierra Terranova, who uh, would essentially be shelved. Now, for Trigger Mike, he would assume essentially all of the numbers control and vice control of rackets in East Harlem once Dutch Schultz is killed in 1935. Now, for fat Tony Salerno, he would come up under Trigger Mike, learning the rackets, learning gambling, learning extortion, learning numbers. Now, numbers were very important to the rise of Tony Salerno. It would make him in to an extremely rich man. Now, Salerno would get married in 1935 to an Irish woman called Margaret Orr. They would have one daughter. Now, Tony, as I said, was very capable. He was an earner. He made a lot of money. And it was rumored that in the early career of Tony Salerno, he was a pretty formidable individual. Now, I don't myself have any stories about hits that Tony was involved in, but it's probably safe to say you generally don't rise to the levels that Tony Salerno rose to by not committing any violence, right? A lot of people always say, we don't know if John Gotti actually killed anyone. Look, John Gotti killed people, okay? He wouldn't have rose to where he was if he didn't. It's probably argued that Tony Salerno did the same. Now, as I said, Tony was very involved with gambling. And for the most part, by the early 40s, he was extremely adept 
in numbers. He was making the right connections and being connected with Trigger Mike was incredibly huge. We have to understand and remember there were so many Italians living in Harlem. Harlem was really one of the major thoroughfares for the mob in New York in the 30s and the 40s. Harlem was the birthplace in many retrospects for the mob. And Trigger Mike was involved in the Luciano crime family before it was the Genovese crime family. It was so rich as far as money, prestige, power, and being connected and essentially Trigger Mike's number two was extremely big for Tony Salerno. In 1948, Tony would get more good news. Well, maybe not that say. Trigger Mike would flee New York and go to Miami after he was brought up on a murder charge. Now, the good thing for fat Tony Salerno is by this point, he is a very uh, trusted individual and Trigger Mike essentially gives him a lot of control of his rackets. And by this point, Tony Salerno is a made member of the now known Genovese crime family. Now, I will say this. I don't have documentation of what the making ceremony for Tony Salerno was like. It's probably rumored to happen in the late 30s, early 40s, but we don't have an exact date. And I was unable to find an exact date of initiation. But once Coppola flees New York, Salerno, though never given the title, is essentially a quasi Kappa regime in the Genovese crime family. He's establishing his own group of people in the family. As I said, Salerno is very much the king of numbers. In fact, in 1950, a confidential informant would say that he basically ran numbers at the highest level in Harlem, and he was the racket numbers king. Now, Tony Salerno um, is not only running numbers banks of his own, but he's taking layoff money, and he's taxing anyone that is running their own numbers in Harlem. And by this point in the 50s, Harlem is multicultural. There are Spanish people in Harlem. There are blacks in Harlem. There are Jewish people in Harlem. There are all sorts of people in Harlem. There's Spanish Harlem. There's you know Black Renaissance Harlem. If you were running numbers in Harlem, so if you're someone like Spanish Raymond, we talked about this, you are kicking up to Tony Salerno. You're kicking up five. You're kicking up 7% of whatever you make yearly to Tony Salerno. So not only does he have his own numbers banks, not only does he lay off his own and take layoffs, but he's also making money off every individual independent numbers person in Harlem. And by the early 50s, guys, understand this. Fat Tony Salerno is making in and around $50 million a year. Now, think about this. That's in and around 1955. $50 million in 1959 today is equivalent to like $570 million a year. Like, I don't, I don't think we quite understand how much money Tony Salerno was making from the numbers racket. Like, it was incredibly unbelievable. He was the king in that neighborhood. And again, he had grabbed this from making the right connections. He wasn't an incredibly violent individual. He was very business-minded, very leader-like, and made millions. Now, Tony Salerno would also have other companies. It wasn't just numbers and gambling, though he had a lot of that. He also had a company called Metro Urban Music Company. Now, basically what this group did is it serviced and basically repaired jukebox, pinball, and vending machines machines in and around New York City. So not only did Tony have a huge overseeing of the numbers racket, but he was also basically a king of pinball vending and jukebox machines and ran and serviced many of them. Now, Tony ran his operations out of something called the Palma Boys Social Club at 416 East 115th Street on a one-way street between Pleasant Avenue and First Avenue. And that's one thing about Tony Salerno you'd always have to respect. He never left Harlem. He stayed in Harlem really his entire life. You could always find him out front, inside. He had money piled up in the cabinets. Like it was a very old school 
dingy place full of old guys just running business. And you would go see Tony. You would drop envelopes off. And we're going to go over some of the people in this photo and who exactly they are to Tony Salerno's operation. But Tony hold, held court and ran shit there. Now, I want to talk more about Tony's numbers operation as far as kind of who is involved directly. In 1956, according to the federal government, they would actually um, storm one of the numbers banks. And in that numbers bank, they would assess and estimate that one numbers bank involving Tony Salerno was making around three to four million dollars a year. And that he would establish stuff called drop locations all around Harlem. And that he would delegate certain areas and drop locations were run by certain people. The main individual that handled Tony Salerno's numbers operations in the 50s and 60s was this guy, a person called Alfred Sharkey Coppola. Now, in FBI files, no one actually knew Alfred Coppola's name. All they knew him as was Sharky, according to confidential informants. And we would learn years later that Sharky Coppola was his main numbers operator. Now, he also had Sharky underneath him, multiple people, including Joseph Joe Fats DeSantis, Fat Tony's brother, Sereno Salerno. They called him Charlie Speed, as well as a person called Angelo Zanfardino. Now, Zanfardino is an interesting name in the lure of Harlem Italian connections. As I said, the Palma Boy Social Club was just off of Pleasant Avenue between Pleasant Avenue and First Avenue or First Street. I'm sorry. Now, what I find interesting about Zanfardino's name is if you know anything about Pleasant Avenue and the drug connection, Jerry Zanfardino, who was related to Angelo, was very involved in heroin production and sales. I often wonder, was Salerno, I'm sure he didn't touch it, but was he making good money off of heroin some way? Because look, you don't run Pleasant Avenue just off of where Tony's corner was and not kick up. I'm sure in some way he was making money off that as well. So all sorts of money is coming in for Anthony Fat Tony Salerno. Now, by the late 50s, as I said, Salerno is a very rich man. He's making money uh, all sorts of different ways. I want to get into Tony Salerno's connection to uh, boxing as well. In and around this time, Fat Tony Salerno had uh, connections to multiple people in boxing, including legendary boxing trainer Cuz D'Amato. Now, Cuz D'Amato at the time was training and essentially managing Floyd Patterson, who at the time was an up-and-coming boxer. Now, Tony Salerno would become a financial backer to a person called Bill Rosenson. Now, Tony would help Bill Rosenson effectively uh, secure TV rights for another fight, and Salerno decided at that point to help bankroll Rosenson's company. Um, and no one knew who Salerno was at the time. He would only be identified the papers as someone called Mr. X, who's a financial backer of Rosenson Enterprises. Now, Rosenson worked for a company called Teleprompter at the time, and they basically handled the CCTV TV rights for boxing fights. Salerno becomes a financial backer, a silent partner, but he then becomes identified. Now, at that time, through his connections to Cuz D'Amato, Salerno had connected the idea with Rosenson being the TV provider to put on a fight between Floyd Patterson and a, another boxer from Sweden. Um, now, Floyd Patterson, you know, obviously, uh, they believed uh, they could probably uh, get and, and, and get involved with this, obviously. And they decide to put on this fight between Patterson and Ingmar uh, Johansson. Um, and that fight would ultimately happen uh, in the late 50s. Now, in this fight, Rosenson would work through a person called Charlie Black, who was connected to Cuz D'Amato. And from that fight, 75% of the take went to the mob. And a lot of it went to Fat Tony Salerno. Now, ultimately, Johansson would win in the third round after Floyd Patterson would be knocked down seven times. 
Um, now, in August of 1959, a confidential informant would claim that Floyd Patterson was uh, given a slow-acting drug, and it was given to him to slow him down, ultimately fix him, and lose the fight. So we can probably agree and argue that. Do we think Floyd Patterson knew that? Who knows? But he was injected with something, and that allowed him to essentially, by the third round, lose the fight. And I'm sure Tony Salerno made tons of money. Now, in 1962, a CI would also tell the FBI that in that year, Sonny Liston was involved with a fight. And there were a lot of people that believed that a lot of the sharp gambling money, a lot of it was coming from Tony Salerno and his people. So Tony Salerno, I'm sure, bet it through multiple people as well. Tony Salerno had always been connected to boxing. Now, According recently to Mike Tyson, he would say on his podcast, Hot Boxing, that at one point in his teens, in and around early 1980, he would actually meet Fat Tony Salerno at the uh, Catskill, New York uh, boxing gym of Cuz D'Amato, and that it was pretty much common knowledge that Cuz D'Amato and Tony Salerno were friends uh, deep into their lives. So. That's kind of an interesting connection. Um, Mike Tyson didn't say much more about Tony Salerno, but that he had indeed met him. Now, Tony Salerno, um, it's always really a question as to where he actually lived in New York City. According to an FBI file, by the mid to late 50s and into the early 60s, he had divorced his wife, Margaret Orr, and had been shacked up uh, with a young prostitute that he had met that he had turned into his girlfriend. And she lived at a home on 7th Avenue between 54th and 55th Street in Hell's Kitchen. Now, we don't know if Tony Salerno actually lived there, but at one point someone lived in that location that was incredibly close to Mr. Salerno. And at one point there was even a phone number registered to them there. There were also rumors that he had had multiple homes in the Bronx and other areas in New York, including Grand Mercy uh, and down in Manhattan. So Salerno had residences everywhere. Now, into the 60s, um, he also would purchase a large farm in the area of Rhinebeck, New York. It was a large property equipped with stables, as well with even a sign that read Fat Tony's Horse Farm. So there was always a rumor that Fat Tony didn't like to be called Fat Tony. But by this point, you know, Fat Tony's in his 50s. He's kind of having fun with the nickname. And this was found many years later uh, on the property up in Rhinebeck. Now, I do want to talk quickly about a very interesting um, woman that owned a company called Southland Farms Riding Stable. She would say that she had worked at that company and that in and around 19... 52, she would meet Anthony Salerno. And I want to talk about what she had told the FBI. We don't know her name, but she would say that in and around 1952, Tony Salerno would visit her riding stables and question her concerns um, about riding stable construction, indicating that Salerno at the time was interested in building a riding stable on his part property. She would recall that during the first visit, Salerno had arrived in a large, black, expensive automobile and was accompanied by two or three male companions. She stated that as a result of this visit, visit and in occasionally subsequent visits, she got the impression that the men accompanying Salerno might be, quote, bodyguards. She would further advise that in 1955, Salerno purchased a pony from her, from her for his daughter. She stated she personally delivered the pony to the property and recalled that Salerno had been overly anxious to determine when the exact time the pony would arrive. In this connection, she would state that upon her arrival at the property, nothing was visible and there appeared to be no activity. She stated that suddenly two or three men would appear. She then somewhat became curious of Salerno and the opportunity presented itself. She would question something to his daughter while basically teaching her how to ride a horse. She recalled that the daughter would say that her uncles, quote, participated in a great deal of target shooting in the back of Salerno's property. So basically the horse stable owner that delivered the horse to Salerno's daughter 
basically said that she probably thought he was some sort of gangster, but she didn't ever ask about it. She knew he had like a New York accent and that was really it. Now, Salerno would also have a residence at uh, this uh, location in Miami Beach and that he would often spend uh, certain weeks in the winter down there. And that in one point in the 60s, he was there in and around five to 10 times and possibly met up with uh, Mike Coppola. Now, in the 1970s, Fat Tony Salerno uh, would be indicted by the FBI on charges of gambling. Now, he would at that point hire legendary attorney Roy Cohen, who would ultimately get him a pretty short sentence in the gambling case. Uh, he would serve in and around six months in prison and be released in and around 1981. Now, during that time, due to Fat Tony Salerno's poor health and weight issues, he would suffer a stroke. Now, as we know, in and around 1981, Vincent Giganti would allegedly be uh, called the boss of the Genovese crime family. Now, during the 70s, Fat Tony would operate as not only the underboss, but also consigliere at one point to mysterious boss Philip Benny the Squint Lombardo. Giganti would take over in 81, but he would institute Fat Tony as the front boss. Tony would handle everything on the streets and represented the family in the commission. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about that because I've been asked many times about what Tony Salerno's true involvement as the head of the Genovese crime family was. Now, we can make it clear there was someone above Tony Salerno because at one point he is caught on wiretap discussing with Maddie the Horse on Yellow about prospective new people in the family that we have to get approval of the boss. So there was essentially someone above him. He wouldn't have said that for no reason. He had also been discussed on wiretap many times with Tony Ducks about certain unhappiness with Chin Giganti. They even mentioned Chin's name, which was supremely outlawed in the family. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Salerno's involvement in the commission because he had a lot of sway in the commission. At one point, he would actually overrule Paul Castellano, which shows his authority in the commission which basically would say that Salerno was the head of the commission at one point in the early 80s in New York. At one point during a conversation with Castellano about Philip Rusty Ristelli, basically the thought was that they would once, now that Ristelli was out of prison, they would allow him to come on the commission and certain members wanted him on the commission. Now Salerno would quote, say at one point, now Paul is a wise guy. I told him up there 80 fucking times. I must have said it 80 times. He cannot sit on the commission. And that was in reference to Ristelli wanting to sit on the commission. He would also say, so he comes back four weeks ago and said, quote, you know, Ristelli likes to meet us. Let's meet him, he says, and we'll straighten it out in regards to Paul. Salerno would say that he would respond, quote, there's nothing to straighten out. So that basically says um, that they we're giving Salerno the last decision make in this situation. Salerno would also say, quote, he wanted to be the boss. I said, make him the fucking boss in regards to Ristelli. As far as the commission, they don't want him. That's all. Now, if we meet, we see what goes on. Whether they come to the meet, who the fuck knows? So this also basically tells us that Salerno was basically the final decision maker. Now, it was a commission decision, but it seems that in this instance, Salerno had the last decision. I want to talk a little bit about Salerno's union and construction interests because once kind of we get to like the 70s, late 70s into the 80s, when Salerno becomes front boss, he doesn't handle numbers anymore. That would be in control of his protege, a person called Vincent the fish Gafara. Now, not only did Tony Salerno have a lot of construction, but he also had a lot of union connections. We obviously know about people like Anthony Tony Pro Provenzano, who had control of a local out of New Jersey, local 560 of the Teamsters. He was regularly submitting envelopes to Salerno and Giganti. But I want to talk more about Salerno's other people he had, most notably in construction. I want to talk a little bit about Vincent DiNapoli. Now, DiNapoli had long controlled two drywall companies, but he was also very involved uh, with concrete. Now, his 
involvement was with a person called Larry Wecker. Now, this is Larry Wecker recently giving a bribe uh, to someone outside of his East Harlem business. Um, Larry Wecker has been involved in construction for years. And if we can be quite honest, no one talks about Larry Wecker. But the truth of the matter is billions of dollars of construction contracts pass through the hands of Larry Wecker. And when we look at this photo right here, Larry Wecker is on the far right. You can see LW above his head. That is him in the 80s. Now, next to him is a person called Nick Oletta. Now, Nick Oletta had a concrete company, SNA Concrete, and that was overseen due to the influence of Fat Tony Salerno and Paul Castellano in controlling unions. Now, Castellano and Salerno would also control another person called Edward Biff Halloran, who also had a concrete company. By having this influence over people like Oletta, Biff Halloran, other concrete people, they were able to control the flow of concrete in New York in the 80s. Every yard of concrete, Tony Salerno and Paul Castellano were taking $1 off of every yard. Think about how many buildings, commercial properties, high-rise apartments, businesses. Think about the flowing of money. Now, eventually, they would even make more through things called the Concrete Club. They were making tens of millions of dollars per year. And if you did business in New York, you dealt with the mafia. So for all you people that want to bring up Donald Trump and his mob connections, everyone dealt with them. It's that simple. But Tony Salerno was also involved in everything from drywall to owning a casino uh, to every other thing. And a lot of it was done through people like Nick Oletta, Larry Wecker, Vincent Cafaro, all these people. Now, remember, Tony Salerno and Castellano and the Concrete Club were overseeing large construction projects like the sprawling Javits Center. Everything that went on in the Javits Center was controlled by the mafia. Now, in June of 1983, the FBI would be tipped off of a commission meeting in and around this restaurant supply company, a place called Bari Restaurant and Supply on Houston Street in Manhattan. I want to go over a pretty funny uh, involvement uh, of Tony Salerno. And at one point in the restaurant meetup, Paul Castellano would spot an FBI agent called Joe O'Brien appearing through a window. Now, O'Brien had been stalking Castellano and the boss immediately recognized him and sounded the alarm. At one point, Vincent the Fish Cafaro, who was at the meeting, would say a, a very funny story about uh, Mr. Salerno. He would say that at one point, there were agents there. I had to go through a window. They had to, quote, push Tony through the window to get him out. He couldn't fit. He was too fat. So that's a pretty funny story about Tony Salerno that you know, and he would say that once they wiretapped him back at Palma Boys, he would talk about the fact that he couldn't get through the window because he was too rotund. Um, now, in 1985, as we know, uh, Fat Tony Salerno would be indicted by the federal government in the commission trial. He had to face the long possibility that he may never see the light of day again due to his involvement in the mafia. But there was a probability that Tony Salerno probably believed that he had nothing to worry about. He wasn't the boss of the Genovese crime family and that it was proven. He couldn't uh, be brought up because uh, he wasn't the actual boss. And he had talked about that. Now, sadly for Tony Salerno, there was a lot more uh, bad information that would come out. In 1986, he would be named the number one crime boss in the country. And that basically he was the man as far as money was concerned. No one had made more money than Tony Salerno. And they would say that he had controlled everything from drywall to concrete to even hot dogs. At one point, Tony Salerno had controlling interest in a company called Marathon Enterprises, a food processing company out of New Jersey, and that his ex-wife was on the paperwork. Now, they did things as far as selling meat and other uh, processed meats to everything from Yankee Stadium to supermarkets. Salerno controlled pretty much everything, and he had his hands in everything. In the magazine, they would say that he was, quote, the top gangster in terms of power, 
wealth, and influence. And he'd be painted as the lead defendant in the commission trial. The problem, though, was he wasn't the actual head of the Genovese crime family. Now, it got worse because in 1986, his main protege, a guy that had been around him since he was in his 20s, Vincent the Fish, Kafara, would flip and start talking to the feds. Now, Kafara would detail in his testimony why he believes he turned. He would say, quote, I had owed Tony $65,000 and we were arguing every day over the money. I then paid him the money. He would then say we had several slot machines going. I had slot machines in the streets and I used to give Tony a third. So one day I told him, quote, he's got no more revenue coming from the slot machine. Whatever comes from there, I'm keeping. Salerno would respond, quote, no, it's my business. I said, no, it's not your business. It's mine. I created it. So he says to me, quote, I'll pick up the cane, this cane, and I'll hit you with it. So I say back to him, well, that's the biggest mistake you'll make in your fucking life. And if you ever pick up that cane to me, and that's how I think I turned. So that wasn't helpful, I don't think, to Salerno. Now, I don't know that Kafara really offered that much in terms of being a credible witness, but it was definitely problematic. It was also common knowledge that eventually George Barone, one of the hitmen for Tony Salerno, will cooperate. He has a pretty interesting story. Now, Tony would ultimately plead not guilty uh, in the commission case. He would be convicted in 1986, and in January of 1987 would be hit with 100 years in federal prison. Now, in March of 86, he would be hit in a second indictment for his involvement of controlling the many unions in New York City, as well as his involvement in what we would call the Concrete Club. He would get 70 years in that case. Now, at one point during a trial or the trial, the commission case trial, Tony Salerno was waiting for the trial to begin one day when he was eating a chocolate bar. Now, a agent would come up to Salerno and offer him a more nutritious granola bar, and basically that maybe he should watch his weight a little bit. Salerno would respond with, quote, who the fuck cares? I'm going to die in the fucking can anyway. Now, we have to go and argue that in the end, there was no bigger gangster than Tony Salerno. All he had to do was say, I'm not the boss. This guy is. I'm not the guy. Salerno didn't. He took it on the chin, and that was that. And this is what interests me so much about these people. In the end, they know there's only one end, death. And it's either going to be in jail, or maybe you'll get lucky and die in your own bed. But cooperating, living a regular life, that ain't no option. The reason the mafia folded was twofold. Rico and the fact that there just ain't many people like this still around. Now, ultimately, Tony Salerno would be shipped off to federal prison. And many photos would circulate, including this one, where he can be seen uh, visibly older, still with his cigar in his mouth, in a wheelchair. This photo would ultimately circulate as well in the early 90s, while Tony Ducks, who would also be hit with a long prison sentence, the commission case, would be seen with his old friend. Fat Tony Salerno. In the end, on July 27th, 1992, Fat Tony Salerno would die. Now, by this point, he had allegedly had prostate cancer and had developed diabetes due to his weight. At the time of his death, he was 80 years old. Fat Tony Salerno would be buried at St. Raymond Cemetery in the Bronx. Here you can still see his crypt. I want to end this video, and I know it's a bit long, but I had to get in information. I want to end this video with a funny back and forth between Tony Salerno that you may have seen. As Tony Salerno is walking out of the courthouse to get into a waiting vehicle, a news reporter would say to Tony, quote, do you have anything to say, Tony? Salerno would respond with, quote, yeah, go fuck yourself. To which the reporter would respond, thank you. Salerno would say, quote, you're welcome. Fat Tony Salerno was an ornery guy. Many people would argue he was a crabby guy, but in the end, 
he always wanted his money and was always looking for a way to gain a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, or a million dollars. He is the prototypical gangster. And in my estimation, central casting to what a gangster is. We can talk about John Gotti or Al Capone, but in the end, Tony Salerno built the Genovese crime family and the mafia into the highest level it had been in years. Did he ever make a billion dollars? Probably not, but he made a lot of money. It's that simple. Fat Tony Salerno is my favorite gangster if I have one. And I had to do a video on him. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next week here on the 